اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ ٹوڈیز ٹاپک از کنٹینیویشن اف اور آن پریکٹسز سننا اف رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم دی ففتھ ون ان دس سیریز وی ہیو بین ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ حدیث کمپائلیشن آئی شوڈ سے اینڈ this this will be the third one in that in that part subset of the series uh, and uh, on the four schools the second session so to give you a better idea about that uh, this is what we did in the last uh, four sessions today is the fifth session uh, in the first two of the last four sessions we talked about the importance of sunna mostly as per the quran citing from the Quran. So that was the first two of the last four sessions. And uh, the third session was, uh, I went over the painstaking process of verifying and uh, authenticating Hadith and the personalities who were involved in that arduous process their dedication and integrity, mention of the personalities. And then I thought of talking about the first two of the four schools of Islamic juris jurisprudence. And that was the last uh, uh, session. Um, there was time uh, only to talk about uh, two of the four Imams, first two, uh, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa and then Imam uh, Uh, Malik, Anas, uh, Malik ibn Anas. And uh, today I will inshallah uh, present uh, some of the features of the last two Imams and their schools of jurisprudence. Uh, the understanding of the laws and code of Islam of conduct of Islam. The laws and code of conduct of Islam has consistently evolved throughout history. Uh, the, uh, during the first generation of Muslims, after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they had a much easier time understanding what is expected out of them because they had the Sahaba. And the Sahaba, they had Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As time progressed, however, a need arose to codify Islamic laws into organized and easy to access juristic codes for the common masses. The first person who undertook this monumental task was Imam Abu Hanifa and soon thereafter Imam uh, Anas ibn, uh, Malik ibn Anas. Through his efforts, the Hanafi school, the first school of fiqh developed and through the effort of uh, Imam Malik uh, later on developed the Maliki school. And uh, in this slide, it took me quite a bit of time, actually, hours, to get the information and to put them in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, terms of their birth and place, death and place, lifespan, in terms of uh, their origin, the places they traveled, a uh, brief idea about that, and the books they wrote. Uh, and by the way, um, some of the information just cannot be Um, accurate because uh, how many books they wrote. Uh, for example, Imam Shafi, the number goes from 100, more than 100 to 140 to 170. And many of the books are not even uh, existent. So you, you, you cannot verify, uh, even though somebody may write that uh, these were the books written by Imam Shafi. Uh, where are the books? Major book, who were the major or most prominent teachers and the most prominent students. So first comes Imam Abu Hanifa in terms of birth, 70, all the dates are in, in Hijri, uh, 70, uh, 70th year of the Hijri. And then he died uh, 80 years later in Baghdad uh, of Persian origin, 
but then his grandfather came during the time of Ali Raziallahu Anhu, actually came as a slave. Uh, and uh, Ali Raziallahu Anhu is reported to have prayed for the, the um, family of the, of the grandfather of Imam Abu Hanifa. So, and, and he said, they said, he settled actually, the grandfather settled in Kufa. Ali Raziallahu Anhu's capital was Kufa. And uh, places he traveled, mostly Hejaz, to gather knowledge. And all these travels are for the purpose of seeking knowledge. Five books are attributed to him today. Allah knows how many books he may have written. He's major. There's a masnad of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa that I did not know about. And masnad of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Shafi and masnad of uh, uh, humble, uh, Imam Humble, Rahmatul Alayhi. And uh, the, the most prominent teacher of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa Rahmatul Alayhi uh, was Jafar al Sadiq, who is descendant of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his most prominent students are Abu Yusuf and Al Shaibani. And then comes Imam Malik, uh, known as the, the Imam of Medina. And interesting about him, among all the major figures in this compilation and collection and uh, codification uh, of hadith, uh, he is the one person who was born in Medina and he stayed in Medina, other than going for, for Hajj to Makkah. And he lived a long, uh, among all of them, a long 86 years uh, from Banu. Ash Asbahi that came from Yemen and settled in Medina. He's again his grandfather. Uh, and uh, we don't know how many books he wrote, but uh, his most famous book is Al Muwatta. And then he learned from the former slave of, of uh, Omar bin Abdullah, Nafi Maula ibn Omar. And also Jafar Sadiq, who was also the teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa. And his most famous student was uh, Imam Shafi. And then comes uh, on the year of the, the passing away of Imam Abu Hanifa was born Imam Shafi in Gaza, Askalan, Gaza, Palestine. Uh, and he uh, met a violent death in uh, 204, uh, in 204, actually 241, uh, no, this is correct, 204 uh, AH in Fustat, Egypt, when he was 54 years old, from Banu Mutalib, the sister clan of Banu Hashem of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he traveled uh, all over Hejaz, Yemen, Egypt, Baghdad, seeking knowledge, uh, is credited with um, 100 plus books. Masnad Kitab al Um and Risala are the most famous. His uh, teacher was uh, Imam Malik and uh, Al Shaibani, uh, the, the, the famous scholar who was student of Imam Abu Hanifa. And his uh, most famous student was Ibn Hanbal. In 164 AD, <clears throat> was born. In Baghdad, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and he died 77 years later. And by the by the way, the years are in Hijri in terms of Hijri calendar. He he died 77 years later, or 74, 75 years in the in the uh, Christian calendar. Uh, he is from Banu Zuhul. He traveled in Hejaz, Iraq, Syria, Syria. 15 plus books are credited to him. Masnad is his most famous book, 27,000 Ahadith. Imam Shafi was his, was his teacher, most famous teacher. And Abu Yusuf, a student of Imam Abu Hanifa, was also the teacher, uh, among the famous teachers of, of uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And his most famous, possibly his most famous uh, student was uh, Imam Abu Dawud. Rahmatullah alayhi. May Allah bless all of them. 
So last week, as part of series of hadith compilation, I presented on the first two of the four and their uh, schools. It is a drop from a sea of knowledge. So uh, you see, I feel guilty that I uh, can, within the time allotted, I can talk uh, much less than what should be presented uh, to do justice to these great souls. Uh, so it's like a drop from a sea of knowledge and I get a drop from what is out there. And from that drop, I present a, a minuscule uh, quantity. So, so much is left out. After the first two Aima, Imam Shafi and Imam Ahmad Ibn Hanbal, um, we will talk about them. And um, again, and their schools, all briefly. Behind each presentation of 45 to 50 minutes, I, I might take a little longer today. Um, uh, behind each presentation involves about 20 hours of effort. I get to know a great deal about these people about whom I am talking, but I also go over the people uh, in their lives uh, or, or associated with them in one way or other. And as a result, uh, there is a great deal that I get to know, but I can present a tiny amount. And the feeling in me intensifies as I read about these great souls that I've wasted my life. Imam Shafi, his full name uh, is Abu Abdullah, or Abdullah, as we use the term, Muhammad ibn Idris al Shafi, was born in Gaza, Palestine, an orphan in a poor family of Hashemi lineage. Uh, and uh, the same year that Abu Hanifa died, mother brought him to the city of Makkah. Father was, uh, he was an orphan and made him join circle of ilm. And uh, Imam Shafi loved knowledge. Memorized hadith from listening. He had to memorize hadith from listening and listening because poverty did not permit him to buy books or parchments. To write, he used old pottery, pieces of leather, old parchment, bones, etc. Lived in the company of Banu Hudail and this is a tribe that speaks uh, pure classical Arabic. And uh, Imam Shafi, he spent about 10 years with them. And he spent more time later on uh, in the desert. And so when he spoke, it was pure classical Arabic. He memorized the Quran by seven and a version of Muatta by 10. And he was a reference poet. He was a poet also. He was a reference poet by 10. And Mufti at the age of, in one place, 15 years, at the age of 20 in another place. Amazing memory. And he's reported to have said, my focus, my love, my preoccupation are in two things, archery and knowledge. He practiced archery and he was so good in archery that he got 10 out of 10 in archery. But somebody mentioned to him, your uh, precision in knowledge is even better than your precision in archery. <clears throat> Arab looking, tall, muscular, strong build, strong presence, wherever he went to, people would look at him. Spellbinding speaker. From 100 to 170 books, Kitabul al um and Risala are his most famous books, documented his mazhab with his own hands. For the, for the other imams, their students did the documentation from the teachings that the students got. He summarized his usul in a book called al um contains opinions of Abu Hanifa and others. Scholars said, you can see the spirit of Abu Hanifa throughout the book al um So that speaks about uh, the influence of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa in his life. And what he said about his work is, I'm, correct, I'm writing a book correcting the views of my own master. He considered Imam Malik to be his master, al-Malik. But 
what happened was uh, in doing so, uh, people rather than having an open mind uh, to, uh, to, to uh, availability of new verified hadith as time progressed, as more hadith was available, rather than pe people being open-minded about new hadith, accepting new hadith, uh, sahih hadith, uh, many or some of them became his enemies. And uh, actually, he's, he met his end uh, at the hands of, uh, of one of uh, the supporters of or followers of Imam uh, Abu um, Imam uh, Al Malik. We'll talk about that br briefly later on. And he is reported to have said, "Throw away my opinion if it goes against the Sunnah." And that was the saying of all the four Imams. They did not imply blind following. He accepted any advice from anybody who could present dalil documents to him. He would listen until the person finished, like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would listen when his person was speaking. Once visited the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa, and this speaks about the greatness of this Imam. So he happened to be in the city where Imam Abu Hanifa was buried, and uh, he uh, visited the grave of Imam Abu Hanifa and prayed for him, and uh, uh, prayed in the nearby masjid without raising his hands. So people saw that and asked him, and this is the first time we are seeing you, not raising your hands when you know Allah Akbar, and then every time you do Rafadain and all that, Allah Akbar, every time you stand up or go for ruku. So uh, they asked him, and he said, I'm not doing that. I'm praying as per the, as per the uh, uh, opinion of Imam Abu Hanif out of respect for him. And uh, this, this was very impressionable to me, and I had uh, my, my eyes moistened when I read about this. I actually had heard about it, but I forgot whether it was Imam Shafi or Imam Malik. Uh, this thing uh, that uh, he was so respectful of the person he debated with. He never raised voice, prayed for the opponent. Think about us praying for our opponent. And what did he pray? That his opponent win the debate. That Allah Ta'ala bring the truth from the mouth of his opponent rather than through him. That was the type of dua he used to make before any debate. And he said, I have never debated anyone and liked him to make a mistake. I have never debated anyone and liked him to make a mistake. That was Imam al-Shafi. And that itself speaks volumes about him. To understand his greatness, we don't need to know more, more than that. The only time I heard about, I've read about so many historical figures, only time I heard about any historical figure, something like this. So it was like give and take, listen and speak, don't criticize personally, no egos in all differences of opinion. <clears throat> he was a student of scholars, Malik ibn Anas and Muhammad Shaibani, the famous Hanafi intellectual in Baghdad. He visited, and there were many other teachers actually. He visited most of the great centers of Islamic jurisprudence in the Middle East during the course of his travels and amassed a comprehensive knowledge of the different modes of legal theory. <clears throat> Al Shafi emphasized the final authority of the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that even the Quran was to be interpreted in the light of traditions, that is hadith, and not vice versa. Interpret Quran in the light of hadith, sahih hadith. His influence was such, in, in doing so, his influence was such that he changed the use of the term sunnah. Previously, you know, sunnah could mean sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or sunnah of a particular uh, tribe their manners and customs, 
because sunna means way. He changed the use of the term sunna until it invariably meant only the sunna of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And among uh, and according to John Burton, an Orientalist, this was his principal achievement, according to this scholar. <clears throat> sunnah came to me in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ahadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam have to be accepted without questioning, reasoning, critical thinking. If a hadith is authenticated as coming from Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we have to resign ourselves to it, he said. And your talk and the talk of others about why and how is a mistake. The focus of the Muslim community on a hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So actually what happened as a result was the, the fo focus of the Muslim community went to the ahadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and disinterest in traditions of companions whose ahadith were commonly used before Al-Shafi. That means the, the traditions of uh, companions. What he, is, what he tried to establish is we have to see that we follow a com companion saying or doing based on whether that can be traced back to Rasulullah or not. And this uh, is thought by scholar Joseph Schacht to reflect the success of Al-Shafi's doctrine. Ahmed ibn Hanbal considered Al-Shafi as the Imam most faithful to tradition. He's a, he's a student. Muhammad al-Shaibani, his teacher, said, if the scholars of Hadith speak, it is in the language of al-Shafi. Shah Waliullah Dehlavi, you can understand he's from, uh, he's a scholar of Delhi, 18th century scholar, considered Shafi as Mujaddid of the third century. Like other Imams, he faced opposition from the government and people. He is reported to have died few days after he was beaten by the supporters of Maliki follower Fithian. He had a uh, debate with him, and uh, it so happened that uh, the governor of Egypt was a very good friend of uh, Imam uh, Shafi, and uh, uh, Fithian used very rough language with Imam Shafi, and the governor punished him. And that enraged the supporters of Fithian, who were Maliki followers. And uh, Imam Malik was his most famous teacher, most respected teacher. And the followers beat him up in such a manner that five days later, he succumbed to that beating. Some people say that uh, he had other health issues. But the point remains that his other health issues, intestinal, hemorrhoid, got aggravated as a result of the beating. Allah knows best. Shafi school. The Shafi school affirms the authority of both divine law giving, Quran and the Sunnah, and human speculation regarding the law. Human speculation means human understanding, where passage, passages of Quran and or the hadiths are ambiguous. The school seeks guidance of analogical reasoning or kiyas. Ijma consensus was accepted but not stressed. The school rejected the dependence on local traditions as the source of legal precedent. Totally rejected that. Urf, which was accepted by Hanafi school, it rebuffed Ahlal Rai, personal opinion, and istihsan, juristic discretion. It is now predominantly found in parts of the Hejaz, uh, Sham, Levant, Lower Egypt, and Yemen, and among the Kurds in the Caucasus, and across the Indian Ocean, Horn of Africa, and the Swahili coast in Africa, and coastal South Africa, and Southeast Asia. As you can see here, the Shafi school in uh, dark blue, uh, so you have uh, in all these places uh, in in uh, what do you call that Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, the Horn Horn of Africa, and uh, in parts of Yemen, and uh, uh, 
uh, lower Egypt and uh, in central in parts of Central Asia. The so that was briefly Shafi school. <clears throat> the groundwork legal text for the for the Shafi school or law is the Risala, the message composed by Al Shafi in Egypt, which is still available. Famous adherence, and I was flabbergasted, meaning I was uh, totally, I should say, thrown off by seeing the list of his adherents. Al-Ghazali, Yahya ibn Sharaf al nawawi And I came to know quite a bit about him. Um, ibn Kathir, Ibn uh, Tabari, who are uh, uh, Mufassir. Al-Suyuti, a polymath. Tabari was also a polymath. Polymath meaning he had, they went into so many disciplines. And, and then Muhammad al-Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, al-Nisai, Ibn Khuzayma. I mean, who else remains? Just a few others. And then Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, the famous scholar, and then Salah uh, the, the the famous ruler of the Ayyubid dynasty. And then to that you can add, uh, and it is out of jest and that I'm saying, you can add Dr. S.K. Alam to that illustrious list. <clears throat> Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Hanbal, hum, <laughs> we say Hanbal. Uh, uh, Al-Duhli uh, was born in Baghdad, one of the most venerated intellectual figures, profound influence affecting almost every area of the traditionalist perspective within Sunni Islam. The 14th century Hadith master Al-Dahabi referred to Ibn Hanbal as the true Sheikh of Islam, the true Sheikh of Islam and leader of the Muslims in his time, the Hadith master and proof of the religion. Inspiration like all four Imams, I mean, like all the other three Imams was mother who raised him. Once his his friend out of uh, youthfulness said, let's cross, swim the Tigris. And he said, no, I cannot. My mother asked me not to cross, not to swim the Tigris. 21. And the other amazing aspect about Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal is he did not marry as long as his mother was alive. So that he did not have to divide his time between his wife and his mother. After his mother died, at age 40, he married uh, Aisha Umm Saleh. And the amazing aspect, and you don't need to know more about this person, is he said for 30 years, we never disagreed on a word, not on a statement, on a word. We never disagreed. Amazing statement. It, it, need, it needed so much of accommodation on his part, consideration. <clears throat> the best among you, amongst you is the one who is good to his, to his wife. And I'm the best among you because I'm good to my wives. Hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Died at 77, Arab, tall, dark, dyed his hair with henna, clean, well-groomed, memorized the Quran, Quran at young age, Memorized, and this is a middle figure, by the way, as per as per Ibn Hajar al Asqalani, he memorized seven hundred fifty thousand ahadith, and termed he was termed as Hafid al of hadith, and uh, there are about three or three or four other people who fall in that category. <clears throat> Uncle worked for government. And again, this speaks volumes about him and his integrity and, his, and about his understanding at the age of 13. So he, uh, uncle worked for government uh, and part of his work was uh, to spy for Harun al-Rashid. And he sent reports, uh, possibly weekly reports. I don't remember uh, whether it was weekly or monthly or fortnightly. Uh, and sent through Ahmed ibn Hanbal, 
who would pass it on to somebody uh, at the palace and to be given to the Khalifa. And uh, after a few years, Khalifa Harun al-Rashid called this uncle and said, you are not sending me any reports. And uncle said, I have been sending to you. Uh, through whom? And uh, uncle said, through my nephew, Ahmed. Call him. And he was summoned before the Khalifa. And he was about 13 at that time. Uh, what did you do with the reports? And he said, I threw in the Tigris. And the uncle, as well as the Khalifa, they were flabbergasted. Why did you throw in, in the Tigris? He said, those were all uh, riba and spying, and it is haram in Islam. Uncle got angry, and Khalifa said, keep quiet. We are not equal to his status, his understanding of deen. Imam Ahmed studied extensively in Baghdad and later traveled to further his education, sometimes traveled three, four months, had extreme financial difficulties, but never asked for any money through, though people offered, speaks volumes about him. After finishing his studies with Abu Yusuf, uh, student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ibn Hanbal began traveling through Iraq, Syria, and Hijaz to collect Hadith. Ibn al Jawzi states that Imam Ahmed had 414 Hadith. I got other numbers from other sources uh, whom he narrated from. After several years of travel, he returned to Baghdad to study Islamic law under Al Shafi. And after Imam Shafi died, he did not pray for anyone more than Imam Shafi. Of course, accepting the parents of Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. With this knowledge that he gathered, he became a leading authority on hadith, leaving an immense encyclopedia of hadith. And as I mentioned, uh, he had a, a in, his, uh, in his memory, he had a storehouse of uh, 750,000, at least hadith, at least of which he selected 27,000 about in his uh, Masnad. He was a soldier on the Islamic frontiers, traveled uh, for Hajj uh, about uh, two or three times by foot, but many more times on animals. Ibn Hanbal died on Friday, 12th of Rabi al Awal, in the year 241, uh, Hijri at the age of 77 in Iraq. Funeral was attended by 800,000 men as per some his, uh, historians and 60,000 women. So number of funerals, uh, funeral prayers. And, and on that day, thousands and thousands of Christians and Jews converted to Islam. Crucial, he, he played a crucial role in, we have mentioned this in uh, I think last year when we were talking about Muslim rule and uh, left it unfinished. Uh, we will continue that. Uh, he played a crucial role in the Mihna, the inquisition that was instituted by the Abbasid Khalifa Mamun, in which the ruler gave official state support for the Mutazilai dogma that the Quran uh, was created. Uh, which contradicts the orthodox, doc, orthodox, orthodox doctrine of the Quran being eternal, uncreated word of Allah. And that created, and that, that created a lot of commotion, a lot of uh, 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 hard time trial for a number of all the ulamas actually, and all state government officials and all imams and all ulamas, they had to come before the uh, the governor or the khalifa and uh, accept this doc the mutazilite doctrine and among the very few there were there were some there were some famous scholars i don't want to name them who uh, gave an answer like this the quran the, uh, the torah zabur injil forkan all four are created by Allah. 
So this was a way of trying to avoid the harsh punishment and imprisonment that they would uh, that would follow by saying all four, implying all four fingers are created by Allah. But Imam Imam Ahmed Ibn Hanbal and two three other friends were possibly the exceptions. I don't think there were more than two or three as I as I could gather. And uh, at the end, it was I think as per one source, it was only him. And uh, uh, in from another source, there was another friend who who stuck to his opinion. Everybody else who was with him changed their opinion or changed their their um, version. <clears throat> and uh, uh, he was imprisoned, was physically persecuted under the next Khalifa. Fortunately, Imam, uh, sorry, the, the um, Mamun died soon thereafter. And he was summoned before Mamun. And Mamun was in Turkey at that time, Anatolia. And he was, uh, Imam was taken under, under chains to Anatolia. And then the news came when they started their journey that Mamun had died. So they did, he did not have to travel. He had prayed to Allah Ta'ala before that. And uh, Mutasim uh, adopted the Mutazilite doctrine and continued with, because uh, that was the wasiya of the previous Khalifa, so-called Khalifa, uh, that, that the next Khalifa continue with this, uh, with this process of bending the, the scholars. So Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal continued to, to repudiate. He stuck to his guns. And uh, at one point, uh, the king, let me use the term king rather than Khalifa. The king uh, ordered the flogging, about 150 floggers gave him two uh, whips, two whips per flogger. And at one point, obviously, he uh, lost his consciousness. And there was, there was a, a uprising. There was uprising. And Mutasim had to release Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And, and this was after two years of persecution in the in the jail. And uh, at some point, uh, after a total of fifteen years, uh, under uh, after uh, Mutasim came uh, Wasik, and then came uh, um, Tawakkil. At the time of Mutawakkil, uh, this was uh, abandoned. This policy was abandoned. And then Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal could resu resume his, his uh, teaching. <clears throat> ibn Hanbal's principal doctrine later came to be known as traditionalist thought. It emphasized the acceptance of only the Quran and Hadith as the foundations of orthodox belief. He believed that only a select few who were properly authorized were properly authorized to interpret the sac sacred texts. Somebody asked him, a scholar asked him, uh, would memorization of 100,000 hadith, obviously the Quran, and then 100,000 hadith qualify a person to be a mufti? And Ahmed ibn Hanbal is reported to have said no. And then that scholar said 200,000, he said no, 300, and then it increased to 600,000, and he said yes. Memorization of 600,000 hadith would qualify a person to be a mufti. Ibn Hanbal was praised for his sincere acceptance of juridical difference, divergences among the various schools of Islamic law. He considered every school of jurisprudence is correct. His followers, some of them did not. The school demands strict application of Quran and Hadith. It is nonetheless flexible in areas not covered by scriptures. The issues where the two sources were ambiguous or vague Humbly, jurists engaged in ishtihad, independent reasoning by scholars, very qualified scholars, to derive rulings. Additionally, the Hanbali madhab 
accepted the Islamic principle of maslaha, public interest, in solving novel issues. In the modern era, Humbleites have branched out and even delved into matters regarding the upholding of human welfare, istisla, and even juristic preference, istisan, anathema to the earlier Humbleites, which, which were not accepted by earlier hum Humbleites. Unlike the other three schools of Islamic jurisprudence, the Hanbali madhab remained largely traditionalist or athari in theology. Religiously binding consensus ijma was rejected by the imam, validity of the consensus of the sahaba, yes, accepted, later followers Ibn Taymiyyah accepted legal consensus of the religiously learned. Analogical reasoning qiyas was rejected as a valid source of law by imam himself with a near unanimous majority of later Humbleite jurists, not only accepting analogical reasoning as valid, but also borrowing from the works of Shafi, Shafi, Shafi jurists on the subject. Now accepted as the fourth of the mainstream Sunni schools of law, smaller following traditionally before that. Uh, and uh, it, this was after the Wahhabi uh, movement uh, that the Hanbali school supplanted Zahiri school as the fourth um, among the mainstream Sunni schools of law. Hanbalism essentially formed as a traditionalist reaction to what they viewed as bidha, innovations on the part of the earlier established schools. According to Imam Hanbal, scholar Najam al-Din Tufi, Ahmed Humble, Ibn Humble did not formulate a legal theory himself since his entire concern was with the Hadith, the book that he, uh, that he collected and its collection. More than a century after Ahmed Ibn Humble's death, Humble legalism would emerge as a distinct school due to the efforts of jurists, and I'm na not naming them, we don't know the names, who compiled Ahmed's various legal verdicts. It is founded primarily, it is found primarily in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Qatar, four emirates of UAE among the six emirates, large minorities in Bahrain, Syria, Oman, and Yemen, and among Iraqi and Jordanian Bedouins. The Hanbali school experienced a reformation during the 18th century Wahhabi movement. Uh, I'm, I'm totally bypassing that aspect. So Hanbali is in uh, dark green, dark green. You can find uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, and, 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 and uh, what we find today in, in Saudi Arabia is not the traditional Hanbali madhab, but what has been reformed by, uh, reformed and came to be known as the Wahhabi. Um, um, and the output of the Wahhabi movement. <clears throat> the renowned adherents are Abu Daud and, uh, and uh, uh, Abdul Qadir Jilani, uh, Rahmatul Alayhi. These, uh, these are the names that you would possibly know. Ibn Kudama, you may know. Taki, uh, Taimia, Ibn Taimia, we know. Ibn Kayyum, we know the name. And then comes uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, Abdul Aziz bin Baz, and then the, the ones who are uh, alive today are Abdul Rahman, Ibn, uh, Ibn uh, Abdul Rahman al Sudais, and Saud al Shuraim, the famous uh, Imams of of uh, Haram Sharif. <clears throat> And by the way, it is from a list uh, I've taken the ones that uh, you may know the names about. And I will not go over this. In this one, in this slide, I, this is something that I want to deal with uh, in the next uh, halakha. Uh, I have taken uh, uh, the four schools and then I have check marked which are the sources that they accept and uh, I have simply put cross mark, but I think by next week, I'll put one, two, three, four in order of preference. <clears throat> Conclusion today is the fifth session in, on Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
I started with the importance of the Sunnah and then I thought about talking about the painstaking process through which Hadith were authenticated, collected and authenticated. And then I wanted to talk about uh, the four schools. So last week and today's, uh, today's uh, session covered the four Imams and their schools uh, in, a, in a very brief manner. <clears throat> Uh, next Sunday, inshallah, I will talk about, uh, this is what I have in mind as I progress and as I learn more, uh, I will formulate it uh, in the manner that it evolves. Uh, why the four schools and uh, the major differences among the four schools? And some concluding words now. These four imams were amazing human beings in terms of, I've only named few qualities, piety, integrity, humility, devotion, scrupulousness, and obviously scholarship. When we understand how lofty they, they are, uh, will we consider their prescriptions more seriously and adopt? We have to understand about their loftiness as human beings first, and then as scholars. They did not come to divide, but to explain how we can act on thee. And uh, consider the fact that there were over 400 schools in those days. So it came down to four major schools. They needed mastery over many branches of knowledge and the Almighty uh, bestowed on them the intellectual and spiritual and physical prowess of mammoth proportion. You can hardly imagine their intellect. Two types of professionals can be of most benefit to mankind. Doctors and uh, Dini scholars, by Dini, I mean uh, uh, those who have ilm. So two types of professions can be of utmost, of most benefit to, to human beings. The doctors, by virtue of them being doctors, they can uh, bring uh, relief to physical suffering. And the scholars, by virtue of them uh, telling people as to how they can save themselves from the fire of Jahannam, they are doing tremendous uh, benefit to mankind. So doctors are the, uh, give physical benefit and uh, scholars by showing us Siratul Mustaqim, they give us spiritual benefit and eternal benefit uh, through which people can be saved from the fire of Jahannam. The four Imams chose to help the common folks to follow Allah's commandments via the Sunnah of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they made it easy for us to act on complete deed. Uh, Who is going to uh, sift through uh, about 30,000 Sahih Hadiths? To find out uh, how how I should should act on uh, on a particular in a particular situation, it's not possible for the common folks to uh, even uh, absorb and make their own decisions. So th that was the contribution of these four imams. They pursued eternal knowledge and not transitory know-how. They sought spiritual wealth and not temporary worldly possession. They avoided high worldly status, but the world pursued them. They avoided the world, but the world ran after them. They died 1200 to 1300 years ago, but they live in our hearts. Pursued what is everlasting wealth, amilus swaleha, good deeds, themselves, they were of the highest, they were at the highest level in terms of good deeds. Imam Shafi is reported to have finished the Quran every day in Salat, Nawafil prayers. And so was Imam Abu Hanifa and the other Imams. I mean, their personal amal was, was unbelievable. So they, they pursued everlasting wealth, good deeds, and beneficial knowledge. Allah Ta'ala guided them to formulate and codify Islamic jurisprudence applicable under various human needs for human benefit. 
and Allah Ta'ala accepted it. Otherwise, after 1200, 14, uh, 1300 years later, uh, uh, they were, <laughs> so many people would not be uh, getting benefit from, from their prescriptions. They provided the greatest of services, but for the pleasure of the Almighty, solely for the pleasure of the Almighty. And that to me is the source of the acceptance of the Almighty. The reward is with the Almighty. After over a thousand years, people are acting on the knowledge they disseminated. Their book of deeds, their book of deeds is an open book still today. Hopefully will remain an open book. That means rewards going to their book of deeds until the day of judgment. They amassed eternally beneficial knowledge, acted on those compiled, codified and disseminated. Knowledge is available to us as a result. We have to acquire, act, and convey, and be a part of the relay race. Our book of deeds will remain open after we enter the grave. It will be expanded, filled with nur, and be a garden of Jannah to Firdos. We are busy making our home a paradise. We are busy making our home a paradise. Nowhere near can we reach in making our homes like paradise. This life is our life. And so we make effort for beautifying this life. But what about the life in the cover and on the day of judgment and in crossing the bridge? 50,000 years, 30,000 years. The cover, Allah knows how long. This life, 60, 70, 80, 90 years. We want to make it beautiful. We spend all our waking hours in making this life beautiful. When I say this, uh, we, I don't mean you only or, or you. I mean people in general, Muslims in general. They want to make this life beautiful. But life in the cover is also my life. Life on the day of judgment is also my life. The life, the time that we will spend in crossing, uh, in crossing the bridge, that's also me. Don't you feel our life is mostly wasted? There is still time. Over to uh, Tohid, uh, hadith number 24 or 25? 24, Hamid Bhai. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi yassir wa la tuassir wa tammib bil kaid. Rabbi zidni ilma. Allahum manfani bima allam tani wa allamni ma yanfauni wa sidni ilma. So we are in the middle of studying hadith number 24, which is one of the, uh, which is the longest hadith among 40 hadith of Imam Nabi. We are halfway through it. So inshallah, today we continue and take the barakah and the wisdom from this hadith. Inshallah. All right, so let me read the hadith from the beginning. Ya ibadi inni haram tu zulman ala nafsi wa ja'al tuhu bainakum muharrama fala tajalamu. Ya ibadi kullukum dolun illa man hadaituhu. Fashtah diuni ahdi kum. Ya ibadi kullukum jairun illa man at amtuhu fashtat imuni at imkum. Ya ibadi kullukum alin illa man kasautuhu fashtak suni aksukum. So we have already uh, went through explanation of the hadith until this part and we'll continue from the next inshallah today 
Ya ibadi, inna kum tuktiuni. Ya ibadi, inna kum tuktiuna bil layli wal nahar. Wa ana akfir zunubikum. Wa ana akfiru zunubikum jami'a. Fashtagfiruni akfir lakum. Wa ibadi, inna kum lan tablugu darru. Ya ibadi innakum lan tablaku dalli fas fata durruni wa lan tabliku nafi fata fan fata fauni ya ibadi law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ala أتقى قلبي رجل واحد منكم ما زاد ذلك في ملك الشيء يا إبادي لو أن أولكم وآخركم وإنساكم وجنكم كانوا على أفزار قلبي رجل واحد منكم ما Nakasa zalika min mulki shayya. Inshallah, we will try to explain until here today. And the remaining of the hadith will be able to complete the next week, inshallah. So, let's read this, understand this portion in English. Ya ibadi. Innakum tukti'una billayli wal nahar. Oh my servant, you are committing sin whole day and night. Ana akfir zunubat. I forgive all sin. Jamia. Fashtagfiruni akfir lakum. So seek forgiveness and I'll forgive you. Ya ibadi. Innakum laan tablagu dalli fatadurooni wa laan tablagu nafsi fatafauni. O my servant, Oh my servant, you cannot reach you cannot reach me to harm or so that you can harm me or you cannot reach me to benefit me so that you could benefit me. All right, so let's understand about this. this uh, we start from Oh my oh my servant in Nakum, oh my servant. Innakum tuktiuna bilayli wa nahar. So, so in the hadith could see Allah is mentioning here that that all my servant is committing sin day and night. So, what is the first question we that come to our mind that why Allah said that we are we are committing sin day and night. We are continuously committing sin. To understand this. We have to understand that uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created human being. Human being is created uh, different from animal and malaika. Animal and malaika. And we have, we can exercise free will. We exercise free will, but But it's the free will that is we that is fully independent, not our amal. Our action is not fully free. Our action is not fully free. So how it is done? How we we can exercise free will to understand that we have to understand that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created or given us a special attribute, which is desire. 
for for human being and gene, Allah has given the special attribute desire, which is uh, which works on us, which works on us. So this desire is composed of a lot of negative attributes, like greed, like uh, envy, like uh, many other negative attributes as uh, uh, sum up into desire. But this desire result in free will because when we love something when we love something we want to have it and in the intention to have our uh, desired thing we go against the against the uh, advice or against the preference of allah we go against the preference of allah so although we have a negative attributes but that results the output is all not negative fully negative the output is free will so when we make free will free will is totally free because it doesn't affect other people i can i can wish anything i can i want to become a president of United States, no problem because i just want to become the president of United States. it is not my wish is not affecting other people but when i start working to become president of the united states it will start affecting other people so our action will affect other people but our will our free will will not affect other people because our action affect other people so our action doesn't uh, doesn't enjoy the full independence so our action has a limited liberty limited it 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 works in the framework of limited uh, liberty we can do certain action but we cannot uh, do everything because actions are our actions are created by god and in surah fusilat in surah fusilat ayat number 96 it is mentioned that allah created uh, Allah created you and your action and your action so in that case there's a there's a uh, conflict comes in people sometimes think that our our actions are uh, limited because of the because of control of Allah but it is actually limited but it also enjoy it is guided by free will how it happens is that that whenever we make some wish that let's say i want to go from uh, go from singapore to bangladesh so this is my will free will so in such case i would i would prefer to go instantly that means i want i wish that i want to go to bangladesh and of course i will of course i prefer that i instantly go to bangladesh but that's not possible that's not possible so that's why our actions are not fully free so when i wish to go to bangladesh so i have to i have certain way so allah will open up certain uh, certain road for us to follow so i may go by plane i i may go by some other means go by ship or i may go uh, today or I may go next week. So there's a certain uh, possibility that opens up in front of me. So then we again choose which option we want to take. So then we take certain option and and it, it depends on the how many options are open up. Our, our restriction on doing Amal always depends on how many, how many options Allah open up in front of me. So our action doesn't, it's not fully independent. So what I open to, what I actually want to mean here, whatever the point I want to reach out of this context is Human being, the attribute of desire, attribute of desire is negative attribute. 
if we do not control this attribute, if we do not control this attribute, human being will start doing uh, sin continuously. Because of these negative attributes, human being will start doing sin continuously. That is what this hadith means. And it is also mentioned in Surah, Surah, this is Surah Lain. Fa'al hamaha fujuraha watakwaha that we have wickedness and we have righteousness. Kad aflaha, uh, kad aflaha man zakkaha. Those are successful who purify themselves. And kad kaba man dasaha. And those are those faith who uh, who doesn't purify themselves. But who uh, man dasaha, who instill the desire. That is why Allah said that if we do not control our desire, if we do not control our desire, we will continue to do sins. That is, he mentioned in a word that we will commit sin day and night. We will commit sin day and night. But after that, he said, First Firuni. First Firuni. Akfirilakum. Seek forgiveness to me and I will forgive you. So. So to control our uh, control our desire, control our desire, Allah has prescribed the religion of Islam. And we remember we uh, say Allah Akbar 17 times through our salah. We say Al Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen 70 times, minimum 70 times through our salah. Then we also say Eatin as Siddhat al Mustaqim 17 times through salah. Then also we renew our, uh, renew our uh, Iman through Kalema Shahada. Ashadu ash Allah ilaha illallah, Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So this kal inciting the kalima inside uh, azan and also inside uh, inside salah, especially after here to recite this kalima and we renew our iman uh, many times in a day. And this is like a this is like a, a medicine. Just like a diabetic patient, every day he needs some medicine, meta, metamorphine or something, every day he needs. So our salat is a medicine for our uh, disease in heart, which is called desire. All right, so Allah said, Fashtag firuni ak firilakum. So, so he asked to seek forgiveness. So there's a question of how we commit, uh, how we ask forgiveness. So we ask forgiveness to uh, Ashtagfir and Tawbah. So we, if we can recall that, we last time we talked about what is the difference between uh, Ashtagfir and Tawbah. Last time when we talk about major sin and minor sin, we refer to this Tawbah and Ashtagfir. So there is a procedure for Tawbah and procedure for Ashtagfir. Usually Ashtagfir is just saying Ashtagfirullah. That is, we just recognize that we make a mistake, we make a mistake and we we acknowledge our mistake. That is with Ashtagfirullah. But Ashtagfirullah doesn't purely wipe off the sin. But what it does, it, it delays the punishment. It delays the punishment. To wipe of the sin, we need to do Tawbah. So last time we discussed about three steps of Tawbah. Three steps of Tawbah. So three, these three steps of Tawbah is first, is a, we acknowledge that we have committed a mistake. Then we make a sincere effort that we will not repeat it. And then stay away from the same mistake for at least one year. Then Tawbah has been, then the, then the sin has been wiped out. So 
Today, I talk about six steps of Tawa. Six steps of Tawa, because this six step is more comprehensive than what we discussed last time. So first step is, of course, uh, we we stop committing the sin. Whatever sin we're doing, we must stop committing the sin. This is the first step. Second, determine not to repeat it for one year. And then it is done purely for the sake of Allah. So it must be done purely for the sake of Allah. Let's say uh, if we don't do it for the sake of Allah, it will not be considered as Tawbah. Just like if, let's say, I want to marry a girl and the girl say, you must quit smoking, then only I marry you. So I quit smoking. So this is not something that uh, I will get benefit out of it. I'll just, it will just uh, make me get married with the girl, not more than that. So we have to do, we have to fix our purpose always related to Allah, not for any other thing. So third uh, steps of Tawbah, if I do some zulum or if I take away some the right of people, I must return the right of the people, right to the person. This is the uh, fourth step. Fifth step, I must feel sorry for committing the sin. I must feel sorry for committing the sin. And the six steps, I must, I should commit Tawbah in appropriate time. And the appropriate time is before Malakut mouth reach me or before the sun rise in the west. So we have to commit, we have to make Tawbah before this time. So this is called appropriate time. If we are late, our Tawbah will not be complete. So more or less, this, this six comprehensive state of uh, Tawba, it includes almost everything. All right, so we move to the next next statement of the Hadith, which is saying, Ya ibadi innakum lan tablugu dorri fata durruni. Walan tablagu naf i fata fauni. The meaning of it O oh my slave, you cannot reach my harm so that you could harm me, and you cannot attain my benefit so that you could benefit me. So, what Allah is trying to say here is that our, our, uh, we are so insignificant or, or human beings and genes are so insignificant. But in reality, we feel, or in reality, we like to boast, or we like to think that, no, we are not small. We have a big impact. And for human being and gene, myself is very important. So everything moves around myself. So, so the, the human being and gene, they have a notion that when they when they do a good thing Allah get benefited and Allah become happy but it is not actually like that our insignificance is uh, so huge that any good thing or anything that we want to do uh, harm Allah or benefit Allah it doesn't matter It doesn't matter. Especially technological achievement. Technological achievement will misguide us. Because of the technological achievement, we think that we can create or we can control certain things. But actually, 
in reality we cannot control anything even our limbs are not under our control because our limbs will uh, give shahada against us in the day of judgment there's another aspect of this statement that human being is fully The other part of the aspect is our action, just to speak, that our action is not free. Our action is not free. So whenever we want to harm Allah, whenever we want to benefit Allah, Allah will not open up the possibility or, or path to do that. That's why we cannot go against Allah, we cannot benefit Allah as well as we cannot harm Him. So because of our actions and not fully free so this is a bit complicated it's a matter of akida issue if we look at the universe if we look at the universe the universe is so huge if we move in a speed of light we need few seconds to reach moon if we move in the speed of light we need eight minutes to reach sun and we need few years to travel at the speed of light to reach another star in our galaxy and we need 20,000 years of traveling to reach the edge of our, Mil our Milky Way, our galaxy Milky Way. So this big universe, this is in the big universe, there's so many creations, there's so many things and there's so many living things, non-living things and human beings are so insignificant that they have no capacity or no uh, no uh, potential to harm or benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala still give us all the uh, all the blessings. Islam, he give us Islam as a knowledge or a diet. And we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of that. And it is mentioned in Surah Fatih. Ya ayyuhan nas antumul fukara'u ala Allah. Wallahu ganiyun hamid. Oh mankind, you are all fakid upon Allah. You are all fakid upon Allah. And Allah is the only one who doesn't need you. And yeah, and so we should be asking to Allah for everything. We should be asking to Allah for everything. The habit of asking should be such that when we want to eat, we should ask Allah, we should ask Allah for food, and then we start eating. When we want to buy some rice, we must ask Allah for the rice, then we go out to buy rice and it's practically uh, like we have money in our pocket but our uh, car is empty no oil we want to buy oil so we have to although we have money in our pocket but we have to ask allah for uh, the fuel first or gas first then we buy go and buy the gas from the gas station so that is one uh, best way the muslim can leave and the three sahaba especially uh, rasulullah sallallahu alaihi asked them that not to ask anything from anybody and they, they are abu bakr radiallahu anhu muaz ibn jabal and abu dadda these three sahaba was asked or advised by rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that don't ask anything from anybody only ask from allah and this habit has increased their iman to a great level. And this is not an easy task, this is not easy uh, ibadat, because most many people won't be able to do that. That's why Rasulullah didn't ask all his sahabi, he asked only three of them to practice this. So, mashallah, we and also there's one ayah from Surah Ghafid, Surah Ghafid, 
surah number 40 ayat number 16 qala rabbukum qala rabbukum udhuni astajib lakum allah said qala rabbukum udhuni asmi astajib i astajib i will respond to it i respond to it so this is this asking allah subhanahu wa taala is a is a very good ibadat it will replace all our if we can ask allah for everything it will replace all our tahleel zikr everything can be replaced by through asking allah because we are always in need of something in our daily life and we have we, if we start asking from allah for it we remember allah all the time inshallah Okay, so the next part of the hadith, we move to the next part of the hadith that says that Ya ibadi law annakum aw awwa lakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ana atqa qalbi rajulin wahidin minkum ma zada zalika fi mulki shayya Ya ibadi law anna awwalakum wa akhirakum wa insakum wa jinnakum kanu ala afzari kalbi rajulin wahidin minkum ma naqasa zalika min mulki shayya so let us look into the meaning oh my slave even if the first and the last of you your human being and your jinn were according to the most god fearing heart of any one man among you that wouldn't increase anything in my kingdom oh my slave even if the first and the last of you your human being and your jinn were according to the most wicked heart of any one man among you that would not decrease anything in my kingdom so also the almost the same thing allah's kingdom of allah is so huge kingdom of allah is so huge that we have to travel 20000 years at the speed of light to only to reach the edge of our galaxy milky way and there is so many galaxy and even within our own galaxy we are so small we are so so small so we do, we do not affect the dominion of allah we do not affect the dominion of allah so usually the dominion of dunya is determined by the power of overpowering others or uh, how much power, powerful weapon they have how many how big army they have how skillful army they have and how obedient the citizen they have so this is the uh, this is the uh, criteria to decide a dominion which is very powerful but in the dominion of allah it is so huge how many millions of bacteria are there we do not know how many millions of living and non living things are there we have no idea so to be near of allah is so different it is not dependent on human agreement even human agreement or this agreement has such a small effect on the dunya that it doesn't increase anything in the dominion of allah or decrease anything in the dominion of allah so uh, inshallah we will uh, we will finish this hadith in the uh, next week and uh, next week we have some another aqida matter that the last line of this hadith is very important that it is saying that uh, the ink is dry whoever 
it, it, the last line of the hadith said, The pen has been lifted and the ink is dry. Uh, no, 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 uh, no, 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 it's, it's not, that's the other, other hadith. This one is saying that my slave, okay, yeah. That if all the human being and jinn stand in a land and ask me for something and I give everything to them, nothing will decrease from my dominion. This is the uh, second last line. And the last line is talking about that anything that is good, yes. please praise, for, uh, praise to Allah for that. Yeah. And anything that is bad, uh, you blame yourself. We blame blame yourself. yourself. Right. Uh, so this this is also something uh, there's some deep uh, akita uh, concept is attached to these two lines also inshallah we we'll discuss this two, two last two line in the next week and today i end here and open up the uh, floor for questioning if there is any subhanallah wa bihamdihi ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa tubu ilaik uh, let me let me take the floor, uh, uh, Tawheed. You know, when uh, I was thinking about this, whenever I have 10-15 uh, minutes to make talim before a group, uh, and I haven't uh, gone over this hadith, then I invariably want to go over this hadith. This is one of my most uh, favorite hadith. Um, you, you mentioned about this thing, uh, that uh, in our life, daily life, we have various types of needs. We are always in need and we ask from Allah. Uh, and we have talked about this earlier. It's just to remind everybody that when we ask from Allah, Ta'ala, even when we have food, even when we have water to drink, whatever we need, we have. We have money, but we ask from Allah before we buy the shoelace. And what happens as a result is we are remembering Allah more often. In the process of fulfilling our needs, we remember Allah. We ask from Allah. And that's a form of remembrance. And that's one of the highest form of worship because what happens is we establish relationship with him through that process of asking. And we also show that he is the Rabb and he is the Razak. He is the provider. And we are the Abd. We are the worshippers. And we fulfill our needs from Allah. It's just a comment I wanted to make. And um, uh, when you say that uh, uh, that one year, we are determined not to report, uh, repeat it, uh, it, it might uh, create uh, some feeling in others that we can uh, repeat it after one year. Uh, I'm sure that's not the case, that we will not repeat it in the future. But, uh, you know, we are human beings. We may make the same mistake and Allah Ta'ala can forgive. So I, I wonder if you would like to uh, re, re, restate that or clarify uh, why you are saying one year period. Uh, this discussion took place in the past. I don't remember the answer that you gave me. I have more questions, but yeah. uh, after, after you take this. Yeah, Hamid Bhai. Yeah, this discussion, yeah, we went through in the past. Yeah, this one year is actually a representation of a long time. A longer time for human being, one year is considered a long time, but uh, this one year doesn't mean one year, but exactly one year. But it is the way that uh, that scholars, some scholars put it, some scholars put it this way, but it could be interpreted as a long time, inshallah. And about asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's so many benefits. For asking Subhan Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, just you mentioned, it's replacing our, it's it's a, it's strengthening the relationship with Allah. And the beautiful thing is, the more you ask Allah, Allah more happy He is. So if you ask a human being, human being has shortcoming. Human being, if you ask one time, two times, three times, he will be angry or he will be irritated. Human being sometimes he doesn't have capacity. What you ask, he cannot. Maybe he cannot give you. He doesn't have capacity. Possible, but Allah, everything you can ask to Allah, and and there's so many benefits. And 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that, say that, ask for me in many hadith and many uh, in Quran, in many Quran, in many locations. Just now I mentioned this one also, same thing. Kola Rabbu Kumud Uni Ashtabjikum Ashtabjib Lakum Ud Uni Rabbukum Ud Uni. Call me or ask me, actually, it means ask me. Then I will respond. The more, if you don't ask me, I will replace the whole calm. If any calm doesn't ask anything from me, Allah becomes angry. So there's a lot of benefit of uh, asking Allah. And one of the one of the best uh, practice we can learn from this hadith to create this practice of asking Allah for everything. Before we do anything, we ask. Even though we have money in the pocket, want to buy something, we ask Allah first. It's such a good habit. Yeah. Uh, this is the practice of three most important Sahaba. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Muaz ibn Jabal, and Abu Dadra. So we will be we will be uh, doing their uh, their we are we are doing their practice in our life. We will introduce their practice in our life, inshallah. The next question that I had has to do with uh, uh, this, uh, uh, which may be related to this hadith that uh, neither can we harm Allah nor can we benefit Him. Uh, once I was talking with one of my uh, batchmates and uh, I was talking to him about uh, sadaqa, that it uh, extinguishes the wrath of Allah. So when I said that, he said, uh, I don't believe Allah Ta'ala gets angry that Allah Ta'ala has wrath. Uh, he is above all these limitations, anger or happiness. Now, I couldn't answer to him uh, in a manner that it was satisfactory to him, to me even. Um, let me extend that point by saying that, uh, and, and you can ask, you can either answer or you can ask your scholar, uh, the scholars you're associated with, possibly they will have some answer. The scholars that I'm associated with they won't understand the term that I will use now, which is, uh, I consider Allah is in equilibrium. Equilibrium. So when he, that, that means he is perfect. He is above all needs. He is above all limitations. And you can dis, cannot disturb his equilibrium, the state in which he is. You cannot disturb that. And that's my understanding. So if that's the case, uh, him getting angry disturbs his equilibrium to me or him getting pleased disturbs his equilibrium to me. So how do you accommodate this thought that I have uh, uh, in light of this hadith? Or should we accept it as the use of the term Allah's hand and his hand is not like our hand and what he means by saying Allah's hand or Allah's feet, we do not know. So should we accept it like that, that him getting angry is something that we cannot comprehend or him getting pleased is something we cannot comprehend. So uh, I don't know which way to go. This is this is a very uh, one of the uh, deep question of Akida. We have we have uh, understanding of attributes of Allah when there are some attributes, some attributes. Usually, all the attributes of Allah is eternal. All the attributes are eternal. So whether human being is here or not. Whether Allah has started creating or not, Allah is Kholak. He is a creator. He is a creator. So in that way, when we, when we try to see how Allah become angry or Allah become happy, or Allah come down from the uh, first sky to seventh sky eh, to call people uh, that I want, to, I want to forgive you. So these are very much... Uh, uh, hypothetical concept. We because there's when you study Akida, the first thing they say that the attributes of Allah, human being cannot comprehend fully. We cannot fully comprehend the uh, comprehend the attributes of Allah. But what we do is we try to understand some of the characteristics only. It's not the full, what our knowledge say about Allah is not, is a complete knowledge. It's mm -hmm. just a, something. 
we have to we understand for the purpose of our ibadat for the purpose of our prayer so so there is two type of uh, two type of uh, explanation about ang uh, anger of allah is given by two group of scholars one group of scholars say that whatever it is just take it and we cannot say how so they say bila kaifa bila kaifa we cannot ask any question how so this is this is this is our salafi uh, uh, opinion and we cannot ask any question how and then other group like ashadi maturidi this they explain it they explain it what this is a you say this uh, this anger of Allah is something it's not same as human anger of human being it's not the same anger. this anger is a something like absence of uh, absence of uh, other attributes like absence of his love or absence of his uh, something and then they say at the end Allah malu Allah knows the best mm. Allah knows the best. So there's two group of scholars in our in our Islamic uh, uh, Islamic society of uh, scholars. One will use this word bila kaifa. One will use the word uh, Allah malu. But they will come to almost same position from two different sides. One will say take the literal meaning of Quran and don't ask question. And one will interpret it and say, Allah knows the best. So Bila this is kaifa. actually this. Bila kaifa. Bila, ka, Bila kaifa and Allah malum. So this is actually the, uh, uh, is a, if we go to study Akida, like uh, Maturidi, Ashari, Salafi, then we'll see they have explanation of all these things. Mm. They have expression of all these things. Thank you. But but uh, as I said, that these expressions are somewhat abstract. We cannot understand fully. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. May Allah Ta'ala give us the understanding of uh, spending our time in a manner that can make it valuable eternally. Major Afta from 17 batch and his mother lost his mother. Okay. Major Afta from 17 batch lost his mother. Is he 17 batch or 14 batch? Okay. Uh, we may. Include her in today's prayer. May Allah Ta'ala grant her Jannatul Firdos. And uh, dua from Topu. May Allah, uh, Almighty Allah, accept all her good deeds, forgive all her shortfalls, and grant her a place in Jannatul Firdos on the day of judgment. Allahumma Amin. Amir. Amir Hussain, credit number 20. Please pray for me as it is finally decided that I must go for angiogram, followed by putting a pacemaker in his heart. Details will be sent to you soon. After from 16 batch, okay. Direction from Kamal of 16 batch. And Shuja makes the comment, memorizing 600,000 hadith, imagine. <clears throat> there is also an estimate that Imam, uh, Imam Shafi, uh, um, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal memorized uh, a million hadith. That, that's one, one I didn't accept all, so I just quoted a middle number. Those to the mother of Aftab from Major Aftab from uh, 16 batch. 
uh, we pray for Amir Hussain. Uh, he's, he's suffering for many years. Uh, he has been battling cancer for six years now. Pray for uh, Farooq Amin, Mrs. Maskura Ayub. Uh, Ayub uh, Lutfi Ayub is from second batch. Firoz Hussain from fifth batch. Abul Barkat and uh, for Panna, both from sixth batch, Mrs. Mahfuz Reza, battling cancer. Uh, Re Mahfuz is from sixth batch. Abdul Rauf, Saif's father-in-law, undergoing uh, uh, his battling cancer. Jangir from 24th batch, who underwent uh, transplant, kidney transplant. And uh, from 19th batch, Amirul Faisal and uh, Mustafiz Nobel. Mustafiz Nobel is battling cancer. Amirul Faisal um, uh, is suffering from stroke, effect of stroke totally bedridden. Colonel Aftab's wife, Colonel Aftab from 14 batch, his wife suffering from cancer. And uh, Farooq from 15 batch needs a liver transplant. May Allah Ta'ala make it easy. It's very expensive. Apil Musa uh, has neurological complications. He's from 15 batch. May Allah Ta'ala grant him Shifa. Abir's father-in-law, Mr. Muhammad Ali Reza. Uh, he's undergoing dialysis. May Allah Ta'ala make it easy for him. Masum, who underwent brain surgery, removing tumor. May Allah Ta'ala keep him, keep him uh, healthy. Habib from ninth batch, his, uh, his biopsy report of uh, uh, the uh, surgery that he had about a month ago, over a month ago, is due on 26th. May Allah Ta'ala give him a clean bill of health. Dr. Nurul Kabir, not from Orca, is in ICU in Houston. Uh, dua was requested for him in our group. May Allah Ta'ala grant him uh, Shifa, Lieutenant Colonel Anam, not from Orca, uh, contemporary of our sixth batch. Uh, General Hafiz asked for dua for him, for his course mate from BMA, and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Anam has been abducted in Yemen, uh, and he's held as hostage for over, for about eight months now. And a ransom money of about uh, five million dollars or five million uh, Saudi Riyal is being asked by the captive, uh, by the captors. May Allah Ta'ala, and, and he, he, his family, you know, you can understand the condition of the family. His family is in utter situation. May Allah Ta'ala grant him, uh, bring him back to his family and to his country uh, unharmed. And all our brothers who uh, there's some more request, uh, father of Shamim's 22nd batch died a few days ago. Please include our uncle in our prayer. This is from Shafiq. Uh, so far we pray that uh, father of Samin from 22nd batch, May Allah Ta'ala grant him Jannatul Firdos. Dipu's 18th batch, Dipu's from 18th batch. Uh, Topu's father, uh, brother, younger brother. His father-in-law is in coma from chemotherapy for cancer. He's 80 years old. Doctors are not very hopeful. Please keep him in your prayers. May Allah Ta'ala grant Shifa to Dipu's father-in-law. You know, uh, we talk about the patient, but uh, we should also include in our, in our dua uh, the, uh, the relatives of the patient. They have to undergo tremendous suffering. Uh, may Allah Ta'ala be most kind and most merciful. <clears throat> we recite Surah Fatiha once and Surah Ikhlas three times for the souls who left the world. May Allah Ta'ala uh, 
make their cover uh, Jannatul Firdos and grant them Jannatul Firdos. Auzu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. Malik yamitin. Iya kana abudu wa iya kana sa'in. Ihtina sirat al-mustaqim. Sirat al-ladina na'amta alihim. Ghayr al-maktubi alihim. Walatu'anin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allahu samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Jazallahu anna Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ma huwa ahlihu la ilaha illa Allahu al-halim al-kareem. سبحان الله رب العرش العظيم والحمد لله رب العالمين أسألك موجباتي رحمتك وزائم مغفرتك وغنيمة من كل بر وسلامة من كل إذ لا تدلنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا حما إلا فرشته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا دينا إلا كذيته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا مسلما إلا نصرته ولا مسلما إلا رحمته ولا حاجة حاجتاً یا لکھ ریدان الا قضیتا ہے یا رحم الرحمین یا رحم الرحمین یا رحم الرحمین اللہم سلوکا من خیر مسلکا من ہن نبیوکا محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و نعوذ بکا من شر مستعزاکا من ہن نبیوکا محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم انت المستعن و علیک البلاغ و لا حول و لا قوت الا باللہ علی العظیم یا پروردگار یا خالق الباری المصابر یا عزیز الجبار المتکبر یا مالک الملک یا ذو الجلال والاکرام یا فاتر السماوات والعرض انت ولی فی الدنیا والآخرہ واللہ واللہ whatever توفیق you have given to us most mercifully to listen to you to talk about you and your نبی صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم واللہ and, and the great souls that you have created and uh, given to us to make deen easy for us to interpret the, the, the application of your commandments. Oh Allah, give us the understanding and give us the ability to follow your commandments completely, to enter deen completely so that we, don't, we do not end up in the grave without being a Muslim. As you have, you have, you have uh, mentioned in the Quran, do not come to the grave without being a Muslim. Wallah, give us the ability to understand Deen, to act on Deen, and to convey Deen to others, Allah, so that our book of deeds is open after we die, and open until the day of judgment. Allah, you you accept us among your chosen chosen abd worshippers Allah your acceptance is the key Allah you accept us Allah Allah may, may we be under your mercy under your guidance under your protection under your hedayat Allah <clears throat> Allah if you make it easy for us everything is easy otherwise the most easy thing will remain difficult impossible for us Allah uh, enable us to understand our obligation towards you and to fulfill it and our obligation towards our fellow human beings and to fulfill them completely Allah and fully for solely for your pleasure following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah you uh, accept what we have been able to do today through your mercy and convey the blessings to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and convey the blessings to the souls of our, of our uncle and, and uh, our aunt who have gone to your, to your uh, presence very, very recently. Oh Allah. Oh Allah. And you convey the blessings to all our near and dear ones, our parents, our in-laws, our grandparents, our relatives, our, our uh, friends, our near and dear ones who have passed away. In fact, convey to all Muslims who have passed away. 
you expand their grave, Allah. You fill their grave with noor and you make their grave a garden of Jannah for Firdos. You increase their status every day in the grave and you give them high standing on the day of judgment and under your arsh and make their hisab easy and keep them worry free on, the, on that tumultuous day. And you give them their book of deeds in their right hands on that day. And you enable them to cross the Sirat in the wink of an eye. And you enable them to, to enter Jannah al uh, and, and be in the company of Rasulullah under your mercy forever and forever. And you give us a life in this life acceptable to you, uh, dedicated to your pleasure. And with love in our heart for you and your Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so that we can live this life protected from shaitan, from our base desires, from the attractions of dunya, from the, the whisperings, from the, the uh, whisperings of uh, fellow human beings protected by you, not for a single moment, do you leave us to these forces and you hold our hand and you take us to the grave with Iman protected from shaitan, from his last effort before we die. And so that we can get the best of your behavior in the grave and on the day of judgment and in crossing the bridge and in entering Jannatul Ferdos and living under your blessings and mercy in the company of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, you accept us Allah. Oh Allah, you remove all our difficulties, all our illnesses, all our worries. Give us the good life. Allahumma inna saluk al afia. Oh Allah, you give us the good life. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatu wa fil akhirati hasanatu wa kin azab an nar. Oh Allah, the good of this world and the hereafter and protect us from the fire of Jahannam. Oh Allah, we have, we have raised your hands before the king, the only king. We are beggars, Allah. Do not let us go empty handed. Oh Allah, we have raised our hands before the Almighty, the All-Powerful, uh, we are weaklings. We are nothing actually, Allah. We are nothing before you, Allah. We have raised our hands before the All-Merciful, the All-Forgiving, and we are sinners, Allah. Forgive all our sins, Allah. And in, in, in lieu of our sins, oh Allah, grant us reward that can bring eternal benefit, <coughs> oh Allah. Please accept us, Allah. Otherwise, our life will be wasted, Allah. The remaining part of our life will be wasted. We have wasted our life so far. The remaining part will be wasted, Allah. Oh, Allah. You make, make our life valuable, Allah. Make our remaining moments valuable, Allah. All those who are suffering in this world, you, Allah, you remove their difficulties, suffering from different types of needs and wants and suffering from injustices. And the greatest uh, uh, shortcoming that, that people have is Hidayat, give us Hidayat. There is no end to Hidayat, Allah. Oh Allah, give us guidance. Oh Allah, I could not ask equal to your might and majesty and your magnificence and munificence, Allah. You grant equal to your might and majesty and magnificence and munificence. I've not been able to ask protection from you equal to your might and majesty. Allah grant us protection equal to your might and majesty. Allahumma inna kafu wa kareem wa tuhibu la fu wa fa rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taqfir lana wa tarhamna lana kumnanna min al-khasirin rabbana la tuzid kulubana ba'da iz hadaitana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmata inna kanta al-wahab ya mukallib al-kulub sabit kalbi ala deenik Rabbana taqabbal minna
Samiul alim wa tuhu alayna inna kanta tawabu rahim subhana rabbika rabbil rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa hadhi la ilaha illa allahu muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amin ya rabbil alameen amin ya rabbil alameen amin ya rabbil alameen la ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna mina zalimeen allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Inshallah we will meet on next Sunday. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq. And the way to get tawfiq is by inviting others. You know, there is one way. And uh, we pray for others so that we get the dua of the, uh, of the malaika. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.